I'm Ryan Holmes, and this is Untold Santa Cruz, Episode 2. Whether you live in Santa Cruz, love to visit, or just like to be inspired by amazing people, I'm so glad you're listening. If you enjoy learning from these types of conversations, share the podcast with a friend. And if you know someone with a story that simply must be told, I'd love to meet them. My next guest has been called the Bob Ross of Adobe Illustrator. He wrote a brilliant and timeless political comic strip called Sidewalk Bubblegum. He's the Twilight Ninja behind a camera lens, wrote a popular blog called Straight Dope Dad, a father's view on parenting, and most impressively, to me at least, has the superpower of staying focused, productive, and creative in the midst of life's chaos. He's a professional designer specializing in product design and launches. Please welcome my friend, Clay Butler. Welcome, Clay. Thanks for, thanks for coming over today. You're welcome. <laughs> um, we've been surfing together for I don't know how many years now. I can't remember when I first met you. Um, but we've never had a chance to really hang out other than uh, a little bit of lunch talking about business. Um, I went through all the work you've done. Well, not all the work you've done, but the the breadth, of the, you know, the sidewalk bubble gum uh, comic strip and the the dad blog, and all, I've been following your photography. And I don't think I know anybody with as wide a body of work. I've seen people go deep in one category, right. but you've done a lot of stuff. I what, have. Wh- how? I mean, it's not a typical um, path to a profession. What? How did this start? <laughs> it's a terrible path to build a career. <laughs> That's good. I, I knew it going in. Yeah. I knew it going in. I, I, I enjoy learning something new. And I like being at the edge of my capabilities. Mm. I find that's the most exciting part, hmm. you know, just barely pulling off that drop. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Just right at the edge of whatever you're doing just having enough drum skill to barely get through a track mm. without a mistake. Mm. That's an exciting place to live. And then repeating. So I would rather learn something new and struggle with it, mm-hmm. figure it out, than repeat something I've mastered. Right. So once I master something, I tend to go, okay, I done that and, and move on to something mm-hmm. else, some other new challenge. Mm-hmm. So that's why I picked up all of these projects right and did well in all of them yeah um and then i just move on so i did my comic strip for 10 years and then i was like I'm, okay i'm done right said all i needed to say were so i saw that you said that you promised yourself you'd quit when you'd said yes. all you were you clear about that going into the project or yes. okay i started my comic strip with the idea that i wanted to it's sad when you see a cartoonist that just is doing it for a paycheck and you can tell <laughs> and the worst ones is when the creator dies and they give it to some anonymous team right. that's blondie and dagwood is uh, right. being done that way yeah. beetle bailey these strips right. that won't die so people will go to those for nostalgia rather than something new uh, yes it just it's comforting because right. it just repeats the same thing over and over again and as a cartoonist i felt that was unethical hmm because the craft can only move forward if new blood has a chance. Right. But when you have a, a strip that's been established for 20 years, you're not going to get bumped off that page unless you quit. Right. Right? So you're holding a place. You're preventing a yeah. new cartoonist from entering the market simply because you, you, you have too much of a legacy going. And so mm. it's up to the cartoonist to quit at a certain level. And my, some of my two favorite cartoonists did that. Um, uh, Gary Larson, who right. did The Far Side, yeah. he quit at 10 years. Wow. He goes, I'm done. Just walked away. I've done it. And his strip was huge. Yeah. He could have did that indefinitely until it was crappy and still would have ran because it's, it, he's, built, he's living on his legacy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then and uh, the Burke other? Breathed, who did uh, Bloom County. Oh, yeah. He quit at 10 years, too. So I thought that's going to be my plan. I didn't plan on being 10 years, yeah. but it also ended up being it was. 10 years. Yeah. And I thought, I will quit when I start repeating myself. Okay. So after 10 years and about 250 some strips, um, I was just, every idea I came up with was just retreading 
an idea I'd already addressed and my new take on it wasn't any better mm-hmm. than the first. Do you do you find that uncomfortable or was it an, just an idea? I mean, is it uncomfortable in the moment when you're doing something again and you know you're just sort of well, trotting just, it back out again? I just don't do you it. You just don't do it. That's the thing okay. is I would just go, oh, I already did that. Yeah. I already covered that. Okay. I already covered that. And so I said, you know, it's time to quit. Yeah. So I just, I um, put all of, the strip into an ebook that mm-hmm. I give away for free. Yeah. I converted my font, my, my hand lettering into a font that you can download yeah. if you want to. And I, so I, I downloaded just, it. <laughs> yeah. And so I just give it away. I just gave it away for free and I still get reprint requests mm-hmm. from actually a lot of textbooks around the world um, because of the timeless nature of my yeah. subject matter. Um, I end up in, uh, uh, psychology books, political science books, sociology books. Yeah. And then uh, sometimes they throw me some money. And Mm -hmm. most of the time I just say, because I I don't really want to build them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, somebody Mm -hmm. in Brazil, I I don't care. It's a textbook. Right. Just just run with it. Just use it. You know, give me credit. That's good. It it almost feels like um, you enjoyed the process. I mean, I'm thinking back to, um, you know, your description of the birth of that comic strip and you realizing that you didn't even know why you were getting better. You wanted to get better at drawing. You just knew you wanted to get better. You didn't have any idea about, I want to do a comic strip or I want to be an artist. You just said, I enjoy getting better. Is that the payoff for you? I mean, you said that all these things you've done or have been a, you know, an awful <laughs> career path. And I don't, I don't agree because you seem quite happy, but uh, I, yes, but I could, with my ambition and focus and my talent, I could have a big design studio right now. I could yeah. be working with Fortune 500 companies and managing 25 people underneath right. me, and, and I'd be miserable. Right. Right? There's a lot of things, like the comic strip, I'll give you an example. So I thought while I was doing my comic strip, my, my, my uh, sidewalk bubblegum, my mm-hmm. self-syndicated political comic strip, um. I actually got the attention of King Feature Syndicate. Okay. And they go, this is a little edgy for us. Mm-hmm. Don't have any home for it, but your writing is good. Mm. And um, we can, it, you don't even have to draw the strip. We got mm. a bunch of people that can draw, but they can't write. Mm. Writing is the mm-hmm. special part. Mm-hmm. It says we could even, if, if you don't even want to draw the thing, you could just write and we could develop a strip together and see mm-hmm. how it goes. I thought... That's what I wanted until I actually had the head honcho at King Feature Syndicate saying, yeah, let's work together and develop a strip. And then I went, oh, actually, I don't want to do this. Mm. I, when it was an abstract, it seemed it, – because it, it's kind of the step up in the evolution, right? Right, right. right? A it's, syndicated daily strip is supposed to be the goal. Yeah. But then I thought about it, and it's just like, okay, it's going to be six days a week plus Sundays. Right. I'm going to have an editor over my back all the time. Strips are going to get pulled in the paper, mm-hmm. and they're going to run a reprint because it's too edgy that week. Right. Things like that. I was like, I don't – it takes a long time to build the strip. It could mm-hmm. take years before you really see. They, put, give, you, they give you a stipend, mm-hmm. a little sh- small amount of money to do sure. it in the beginning because it doesn't make any money. Right. And um, I went, wow, I – Actually, I don't want to do this. Yeah. So my dr- wasn't really a dream, but um, it, was once kudo- it, was, it was kudos in the industry, but it's not what you yeah, want. Yeah, I thought I wanted it until I actually had a chance to do it. Mm-hmm. And then that made me think about realistically, mm-hmm. do I want to do this? And I said, yeah, I'm not interested. Okay. So you, I mean, obviously you knew you were creative from an early age. I mean... I saw oh, yeah. your, you know, your your Dungeons and Dragons, um, and the art going along with it. it was just, you know, at a at a certain point, it went from you drew like kids drew to you drew like an artist. Yes. And how did you, how did you transition? Because it strikes me that you've always been comfortable with putting your voice and your work out there. Um, when did you know you had something? You know, you wanted to say. And, and how did you feel comfortable putting yourself out to say it? I mean, I see this, especially a, in your blog a, and in your art. Yeah, you know, that's, your um, 
I'm lucky that I was not born with a sense of embarrassment hmm. or shame. Hmm. Well, actually, I do feel shame when I screw up. Hmm. I feel it pretty deep inside. You know, it's like a like a personal failing. It's like oh, I, I really screwed that up, and you know, I beat myself up over it a little bit and then move like on. Like a technical mistake Normal or stuff. like a life mistake. Um, life mistake. Right. Okay. Um, but as far as like, yeah, let's do a television show. I don't really care if anyone watches it or likes it. I'll do a comic strip. I don't care if anyone likes it or yeah. reads it. I just don't care. It's not really in a, the idea that somebody will like it or embrace it is not even a consideration whatsoever. Wow. Can I just you teach do it. that? <laughs> I just born that way. Yeah. You know, I really didn't. Yeah. You know, I, I, now I realize, okay, I was very angry. By the time I graduated high school, I was, angry yeah. just angry at the world angry at everything I mean, you moved around a lot I moved and, around and, a lot yeah. i went to two elementaries two junior highs and three high schools yeah. in one two four states i think that's a lot of being the new guy i'm always the new guy yeah right and i'm not the smoothest socially i can miss social cues and things like that um my partner is convinced i have social anxiety mm. I just say I just don't like being around big crowds. Right. Um, however you want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So you take somebody who's introverted and you move them around a lot and you throw them in a school environment mm -hmm. where they have to constantly adjust and be around people all day long. Mm -hmm. um, you're just going to develop a lot of anger. Mm. And so I was just angry at everything. I just want to get out of there. Mm -hmm. Um I should have quit. I mean, I quit high school. Yeah. You know what? I didn't because now it's different. If a kid's struggling in school, there's alternative school. Right. Or if they show ambition, it's like, Hey, why don't you just get your GED in ninth grade right. and start at, at, and start at Cabrillo college. Mm -hmm. Those type of concepts in the seventies and eighties weren't on anyone's yeah. radar. The yeah. idea that you could do it. I really should have just got my GED early and just started a junior college and mm. been around older people. Right. People with more focus. and I less... would have been much happier yeah. because my uh, a lot of my peers were just driving me crazy, mm. unfocused, and just, I just had, and then I just didn't, I wasn't very good with the social thing. Right. Now I go back, right, in the moment, I'm blaming them. In, right? In, you're, oh, you're, when you were that yeah. age, yeah. You're fake. Yeah. You're this. You're right. that. Right. You're you're just a you're just a status seeker. You're just yeah. you're just clicky. Yep. You were judging like they were. I was very judgy. <laughs> very judgy. I had my strong opinions about everything. Yeah, that's it. Um, Teens are good at judging. <laughs> very good at judging. Now that I'm older, I'm like, oh, who's the common denominator here? Right. All right. I tr I moved to a lot of different schools yeah. and had the same conflicts right. with the teachers, with the administration, with my, I mean, I was, I had plenty of friends on a very uh, shallow level mm -hmm. and then always had like one best friend right. or two best friends yeah. that I had a deep relationship with. Mm. And then everyone else just kind of knew of me. Yeah. Right. Um, You're hard so to miss. So looking back, I'm like, oh, oh, I was the problem. Right. I well, was the problem. I didn't acknowledge people when they said hi to me. Mm. I didn't, I didn't know you were supposed to do that. Yeah, you didn't know. I, I didn't know these things socially. I had to learn them mm -hmm. that you look somebody in the eye mm -hmm. and when they say, hey, bye, you know, or you, if the conversation, if you want to leave, you have to say, hey, I have to go now and you wind it down. You don't just walk away. That's yeah. what I would yeah. do. I'd be yeah. done talking and, or I'd be done with the conversation and I wouldn't wind it yeah. down. I would just walk away. Yeah. And... I didn't understand that was a problem. Now I do. I wonder if um, moving around so much was almost a blessing for someone with that personality because, you know, you mentioned, um, oh gosh, you had a great quote in there about um, get, people that just get down to action are the ones getting it done, having an innate talent. Um I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing, but the idea was that this concept that we now have called direct, uh, uh, direct practice. Is that the one? Oh, um, deliberate uh, practice. Thank you. Thank the you. 10, yeah. Role. The deliberate practice. So 
it strikes me that moving around so much gave you a lot of feedback as to how you were in the world with a lot of different people more than you would have had. Right. And you probably sure. didn't develop as deep a story about all of them, but you also, at some point, it sounds like got the opportunity to practice deliberately how to make this smooth out a little better. I mean, it, you, you said you, you learned to train your teachers um, to leave you alone when you were doodling because you actually were paying attention, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's, I mean, that's the a same, skill. It was the same thing. Every yeah. school I'd go to, having that skill was nice because I would join an art class. Yeah. And right away, everyone would go, whoa, he's like way ahead of it. Right. Right. And so it kind of made me special. Yeah. Gave me right. a little identity. I'm the, the artist, right? I'm the good drawer, which yeah. is kind of nice. So I started off with that little mm. bonus. Um, but yeah, I would draw sitting in class is tough. Can you oh, I had to be closer. Yeah, just yeah. a little, I, I think it's fine, but because I have trouble with the crowds and the structure and mm -hmm. everything like that, I was not comfortable in school, obviously. Right. And I'm a fidgeter. It's like, this is the worst environment for mm. me. Just so I out. would draw constantly. Mm hmm doodle doodle through every class mm -hmm. but you I also listen. were aware that you were practicing when you did that is it yes. sounds like you knew you were practicing your your craft you were trying to get better. yeah i would work on a drawing over several days right, right. in each class okay but it was also a coping mechanism it was a big coping okay. mechanism so and then eventually usually there'd be a teacher and they go clay you know what did i just say or what's the they try to stump me mm. and i would repeat exactly what they said mm -hmm. and they go oh okay so they realized I wasn't checking out. Mm -hmm. This is just like self-stimulation. This mm -hmm. is how I deal. Mm -hmm. And it, wow. I don't know what it would be like to sit through class after class, day after day, without that escape. Yeah. I mean, no wonder so many kids eventually start getting high and show up high sure. in class. Because uh, I because I think about it. I saw the kids that would get high right all the yeah. time. And I thought, oh, these guys are losers. Or, you know, what's their problem? But. If you took my personality mm. and stripped away a strong sense of self, mm -hmm. you know, and an ability to just have a thick skin and not care what other people think, mm -hmm. and also took away, let's say, a talent mm -hmm. to keep me uh, focused, mm -hmm. yeah, I could see why you would want to just come to class high mm -hmm. if you had social anxiety if you yeah. felt self-conscious, you just because it'd be too much. You do that six periods a day, five yeah. days a week. That's a lot. Yeah, that was a lot. It would break down in an adult. Yeah, it's a, a lot of stimulus. It's a lot of judgment. It's a lot of trying to fit into a, a structure and a culture that's uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. So when I graduated, I was uh, so happy. Yeah. Oh my God! It was just it was like. <laughs> I felt like a weight was off yeah. my chest and it was really nice. But back to deliberate practice. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, Here's the, what's that's really, the thing that strikes me. That, uh, I never skill. thought I could make a living doing art until I entered the portfolio division my senior year in the Scholastic Art Competition. Okay. I think they still have it. And if you enter the portfolio division, you can win a scholarship to a college. Wow. So I entered the portfolio division. And so I won the, the, the city. Then I went to regional, then state, and then mm -hmm. I won national. Mm -hmm. So I went up the whole chain. Mm -hmm. Got a scholarship of my choice. Cool. So I thought, oh, I guess I, you can do this for a living. Up until then, I didn't know, because this is pre-internet. This is yeah. 1984. Yeah. The idea that you could do creative stuff for a living is just didn't make, you didn't even know how movies were made. Mm -hmm. You didn't know how television was made. I didn't even know how magazines were printed. Yeah. Like who, how do you even do a drawing? How does it get in a magazine? Who makes a book cover? That stuff was all a mystery and there's no right. way to learn about it. You couldn't learn. Now you yeah. just go on the internet and you find out within minutes. Oh, that's how it's done. I wonder, I wonder if that's, um, I mean, I get that having the, there, so there was a barrier to entry for knowing what was possible, right? Huge. Yeah. Cause if you don't know what's possible, right. You don't even know these things are even jobs, right? Right, you don't even know they exist. Yeah. Um, so, for some reason, at a very early age, I was very focused on drawing the best I could. Mm -hmm. And if you look at my early work, preschool, kindergarten, it looks like any other kindergartner, right. right? First grade, a little bit better. It's not until about third grade 
where you start going, oh, this is a little different than other third graders work. Mm. By sixth grade, I really was pulling ahead of the pack major. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I was 15, I was doing like national professional level work with pen and ink. Really and you good. knew in sixth and seventh grade that you wanted to get better. I mean, you were driven. Oh, I don't driven. Know. Yeah. Obsessed. I would spend my weekends in my room, um, and then I would examine my drawing, and mm -hmm. I'd be like, wow, this is everything's perfect except for the sh foreshortening on this arm. Mm -hmm. It just drives me crazy, and I mm -hmm. couldn't figure out how to solve it. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay, I'll solve it on my next drawing mm -hmm. because I redraw it so many times. I just give up. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, that's that's as good as that's going to get right now. But I'll figure it out With what you soon. have now. What I have now is yeah. as good as I can do. Right. So, Were you aware that your mind would work on it subconsciously when you put it down? Or did you just work until you were subconscious. Exhausted? It was literal. I mean, I would no, just... No, I mean, when you get as good as you could and then put that project... Did you do that? Put that project away? I always away? finished everything. Right. Okay. Even if there was a glaring mistake in it that bothered me, I'd wrap it up mm -hmm. and go, okay. And But this guy's legs, not the foreshortening. I still remember the specific drawing. Everything in the drawing is perfect <laughs> except his his forward leg is bent. It's coming towards you, but it's also bent back. Okay. And it looks like he, his leg didn't grow to full length, yeah. and it's just a little off, yeah. and it still bothers me and now of course i have distance on it so i find it sure. amazing i mean i was 14 years old right, right? i'm not gonna beat myself up for it but i knew it at the time that's what i'm i knew about it at the, the time awareness. right yeah anyone else would just look at it and go oh my god so good yeah so good and, for a 14 year old yes but that wasn't good enough for you no yeah now here's the downside of that yeah i pretty much by the time i was 18 my drawing was so consistent i'd pretty much it was just incremental improvements. Right. And by the time I was like maybe 25, I was as good as I've ever was going to get. Yeah. I just, and so it got boring. Yeah. Right. And so I got, had less interest in it. Um, learning, doing a comic strip was of course a new form, right? So I was a new yeah. thing to learn, but I haven't really drawn much in decades. I only do it for projects where it's needed mm -hmm. because I, I don't have any drive in me to express myself through drawing anymore. Mm -hmm. I did that for the first 25 years. Yeah. That was my main thing. And then I did that and it served its purpose and I worked out all the stuff I need to work out. And then I got, it's going to come off wrong, but I got too good. Meaning not in relationship to other people. Right. And this is what I right. refer to art. What drives an artist is they have something in, you have something in your head mm -hmm. that you need to get out. Mm -hmm. You need to communicate. You need to get it out. You can get it in a poem. You can take it in a photo. Whatever mm -hmm. your thing is. Maybe it's sculpting. Maybe it's just building things out of metal. Whatever it is, you have something you need to get out. And in the beginning, it doesn't come out right. Right. Because you don't have the skill. But eventually, you, you master it. And what you see in your head is perfectly expressed in your creation. Mm -hmm. When that happens, there's almost no incentive mm. to get better. So it's the pain of it coming out, not the way it was in your head that drives you to yeah. hone your skills. Once I could, once everything yeah. came out exactly the way I, I'd think of something and I would draw it and it come out exactly the way I saw it mm. every single time, I don't think I know what that feels like. I mean, I don't know how many people do. It's kind of neat. Yeah. I mean, it's a neat it's a neat skill to have. It's a, you feel really accomplished when you right. do it, but it's also kind of a letdown. But because the talent there's is, no uh, what's the point at a certain point? Well, the, to me, it seems like the point isn't the talent isn't the drawing talent. The talent is your willingness to work through difficulty and discomfort and imperfection and put in the work to get to that point. I mean, you did that with, with your, um, comic yeah. series. You did that with your blog. Um, the, um, uh, uh straight dope dad, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, which by the way, I like the way that, um, the name flows. Um, so you did that with that blog until you felt like you'd said enough or gone as far as you wanted. And now you're doing that with uh, twilight ninja as well. Yeah. And here's the thing that, I'm interested in particularly is that when you finished your comic strip, you also put in a, um, a tutorial on how to 
draw comic strips. Yes. And then in Straight Dope Dad, you were telling it like it really was and letting people learn through uh, the trials and tribulations of being a father, which had the added gift of letting people know that their experience was okay and normal. Yes and part of getting better. And now in Twilight Ninja, you're offering uh, workshops for people and you know, displaying what glory the world has at, at, at dawn and dusk. So you have this teaching part to you, and it seems like you're drawing people to you. Are you do you find a lot of satisfaction in that? I love it. Okay. I really like to... I get a big thrill out of someone uh, improving their situation huh. or or uh, taking off with a with a piece of information I give them. I think it's a big thrill because I, I I don't believe in the zero sum game. Yeah, I think the world's kind of there's there's uh, you know people say oh it's right versus left Republican versus Democrat and right. yeah there's. Th those are like, superficial. Underlying that, there's different, actually, worldviews. They're expressed through politics. They're expressed through these tags, these names that we right. categorize. But there's actually something deeper going on. It has to do with trust and not trust and right. things like that. Zero-sum game or not. Mm -hmm. I don't see a zero-sum game. I think there's an infinite amount of wealth that can be generated. Mm -hmm. I think there's an infinite amount of love, an infinite amount of friendship. Mm -hmm an infinite amount of trust. These aren't, these aren't limited commodities. Right. Some things are, there's only so much iron in the earth to pull right. out. Right. There is, there are some limitations in that, but most of the things we really value in life are limitless. Right. So I want to see everyone succeed because your gain is my gain mm -hmm. in the, in the long run, because when your neighbor's suffering, you're suffering. Right. May not be directly, but it always comes back around. If somebody's miserable and depressed, hmm. it their uh, experience spills over into other people, makes somebody else irritated, makes mm -hmm. right. It so you want everyone around you to be successful and happy, and 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 thriving, because that creates an environment in which you can also right. thrive. Because if you're thriving and everyone else is failing you, th what? Uh, I think that's wrong. I just don't think that's the goal to right. be above somebody else. I want to bring, I want everyone to move forward. Mm. And I hate reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. I hate that idea that we have to keep learning things from scratch. We couldn't have all this. We, you couldn't have these microphones, all of this technology, you trace it back. It goes back to probably some military contract from the 1950s mm. where they're trying to figure out how to make a circuit board sure. for a computer. Right? So, we all stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and that's how it's supposed to be. Right. Cause if we had to start from scratch each time, we would still, we'd have nothing. So I see it like that, that I'm making a contribution to the world by sharing my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Uh, a really good example is I, I do some tutorials, illustrator tutorials. And when I was noodling around in Illustrator, I'm like, oh, this is really difficult to do to color vector line work. Okay. There's got to be a better way. So I'm playing around, and I accidentally found, I don't know if it's a bug or an unintended consequence of using certain features in Illustrator. And one is you can, um, you can do a drawing and do it very loose, and these are all vector lines. Okay. Right? And then there's something called live paint. And what it does is it detects the shapes in between your line work, and you can fill them with color, like a paint bucket. Hmm. Bloop, 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 bloop. Okay. But what has traditionally been done is you use the pen tool to make a very specific line with the start and stop, and then you do another one with the start and stop, hmm. and every line is perfect. No overshoots, uh, nothing. Okay. So I wanted to have a more loose style and clean it up later. Right. So one day I converted... After I did my drawing, my brush strokes, I converted them to outlines, which you had to, because you had to seal the sh brush shape. Okay. So it doesn't just keep changing on you if you switch to another brush. Okay. Because, right, it's legacy and it'll just change everything in the drawing. So by outlining it, it's not a brush stroke anymore, it's a shape of a brush stroke. Okay. So I converted to live paint 
And then I did my thing and I converted it back out. And then I noticed all the shapes where the lines crossed over had segmented themselves. And so I could delete those stray ink lines, mm -hmm. those brush lines that were off to the side. And I cleaned up my eyes. I said, wow, that's really interesting. So I kept trying it over and over again. I said, wow, this really speed things up. You're allowed to do loose, mm -hmm. flowy art and then clean it up very easily hmm. using the paint, but the uh, live paint tool hmm. that also doubles as a way to clean up ink lines. Okay. That's not intentional. Okay. And it's the only tool in Illustrator that does that. Huh. So I was like, wow. So I went online yeah. and I said, uh, I just kept searching. Nobody was talking about this. So I made a tutorial. Cool. And I just drew like a demon head. I just made something up live. It's right. like eight minutes long. Yeah. And I explained how to use this method. And then I put it up there. Is that on YouTube? Yeah. Okay. It's got 1.3 million wow. views. Uh, like, I don't know how many thousands of thumbs up, 2,500 comments. Yeah. And every comment is like, dude, you just blew my mind. You <laughs> changed my life. <laughs> now I'm going to get an A. I was stressing <laughs> out and I had to get this project in for class the next day. And there's no way I was going to do it. And I read your, I, I watched your tutorial and it was so easy. I was able wow. to knock this out in a couple of hours. And it's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments where people are just like, this is the greatest thing ever. It's changed wow. my life. And people are still coming back years later going, dude, they just, kind of, they feel the need to come yeah. back and say, just got to tell you, man, every time I see this tutorial, it brings me back to the old days That's and cool. how changing this was. And what's really interesting, the big thing was, it was, is Illustrator is a vector program and it's very daunting mm. to an artist because it's counterintuitive to the way you draw on paper. Yeah. It's math. Right. It's a completely, it's anchor points. It's, it's not like Photoshop. So every, uh, every artist gravitates toward Photoshop because all the tools are just like paper. Right. And they shy away from Illustrator and then they try Illustrator and they go crazy trying to figure this out. Mm. I created a bridge to allow somebody to have immediate success in Illustrator using methods that they're comfortable with, mm -hmm. which, them, which then allow them to go deeper and learn all the other tools because now they feel like, well, at least I know how to do this. Yeah. Right? So it was a gateway to understanding Illustrator greatly. And, you know, everyone thinks one guy was so angry at, for me for not doing more tutorials. <laughs> And not monetizing my channel. Oh, wow. We got a big argument about <laughs> it. He goes, dude, you know, this, the, this one tutorial could be a little more professional. And I'm like, dude, I gave it away for free. That wasn't even the point, right? That wasn't even the point. Yeah. I'm not trying to be professional. Well, you should, because this is your work and this is your portfolio and this, this reflects on you. I'm like, I don't care. And he goes, you're not even monetizing your channel. I said, I don't care. He goes, you got 15,000 subscribers. You're not even trying. <laughs> I said, I don't care. He couldn't. Okay. It was funny. He was angry at me because I wasn't doing what he would do if right. he was in my situation. Would be maximize a thing and and bleed it dry right. and make money everywhere you because. And so I thought it was really interesting. He was angry at me because I he felt I wasn't maximizing my opportunity. What's funny is that the the skill that allowed you to discover that, which was this willingness to just, you know, in, as a metaphor, have loose brush strokes, make mistakes, make a mess, break it, find out <laughs> where the bug is. What allowed you to invent this process is exactly the way you were doing your YouTube channel, which is like, Hey, this is a good idea. I want everybody to have it, throw it out there. So, and then he's, you know, he, so he's literally criticizing, and I don't think he knows this, but he's criticizing the same um, almost bug in your personality where you don't have a fear of being wrong and possibly looking foolish. And I think, I mean, if we could learn this through deliberate practice where we push this limit and become more comfortable with potentially looking foolish, it's, it strikes me there's a lot more in each of us that could be done if we we're willing to make the mistake and make it over and over again until we know how to do it or we find oh. a new way to do something through our mistake. For sure. Because everyone's creative. 
I was going to ask you that because I, sometimes I, I feel like I, I have nothing I, I, to draw. No, you give me a blank page and I don't thing. know what here's, to draw. Here's what I don't like about the word creativity. Okay. It's been hijacked by artists. Yes. To make them feel special and unique. Yeah. Troubles were all, the thing is we're all creative. Right. Just driving across town is an act of creativity. That road is constantly changing. Yeah. People are merging, not using their signals. Someone enters the crosswalk. Mm-hmm. That's just not a, a rote machine mm-hmm. learning. Mm-hmm. That's making creative decisions in the spot. Or we've all had this experience. You're coming over the hill. Oh, shoot. Huge accident. How am I going to get home? And you start mapping out in your head. Well, I could jump over here, mm-hmm. summit, come down nine, mm-hmm. and then the traffic, right? So we living itself is an act of creation. Yeah. Every moment. We're not robots. Right. We don't just repeat the same thing. But artists, unfortunately have hijacked that term and narrowly defined it as music, poetry, mm. film, maybe stand-up comedy. Mm-hmm. Cooking now is considered mm-hmm. an art, right? It's, it's expanding. And then people go, well, I can't draw or I can't write poetry. Therefore, I'm not creative. Mm. But I've seen people who are very good with um, uh, building cars mm-hmm. or working with metal mm-hmm. or just being able to, I have a friend who built a luxury chicken coop cause he wanted to have a really <laughs> with a, with a door that worked with a timer oh, wow. and the whole thing and automatic food dispensing. I said, where was your plans? And he goes, I didn't have plans. I just saw it in my head and I just started cutting and measuring. Huh. I'm like, you didn't, you, he didn't write it out. He actually built a whole chicken coop from scratch. He could pre-visualize it. Yeah. I couldn't do that. Yeah, that's a rare I, skill, I right? I can't. That's a that's a completely different type of creativity and skill and visualization that I don't have. Yeah. I can't just make something. I could cobble like a shanty town together. Do you think you can you learn that skill? Because I mean, you I, through deliberate practice. Again, back to this. You, you know, you took yourself from an average artist, so you could argue that you didn't have. You weren't born an artist. You weren't born talented but you had a something you wanted to say or express. You yeah. took your interest and then leveraged your willingness to work. And if we're not afraid to make mistakes, that takes a huge um, burden. It takes a lot of the friction out of work. Because I think a lot right. of us are afraid to put ourselves out there because we're going to get ridiculed, we're going to do it wrong, someone else is better, there's no future in this, et cetera. But what you just said about getting through life and you know even in traffic, it's, it's enjoyable to be creative and and like, you know, we've talked about this before, but when you're not afraid of losing control and you're just in the moment, you're in that flow state. Yes. And that flow state seems very therapeutic, especially in this, in the times we're in now where there's so much input and there's so much mm, like drama, you know, with news, the way we get our information, all the media. Um, so it seems like through creativity perhaps we can find this flow state and a little bit of peace just in living our lives i guess is there a question there? um yeah. the question is how do you because it seems to me like that's what you're teaching is how to pay attention to details uh and and organize your brain to notice and adapt is yes. that accurate um that's a good question um I never really thought about that way. I mean, I suppose that's accurate. It's one way of putting it. I just know flow. Everyone's experienced it. Yeah. You look up and three hours just went by. Yeah. And you could have just been reading or you could have been sewing. You could have been taking a walk. It's just that it's the flow is when there is no future and there's no past. If you start thinking about what just happened or what you did or mm-hmm. have regrets, you're, you've taken yourself out of mm-hmm. flow. And if you start predicting the future and anticipating the future you're out of flow right flow is that state where it's only the present and you only focus on the present Mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful feeling yeah we all have it at different times in your life um i'm constantly seeking it out without without consciously seeking it out (laughs) right i just know what i like i can get it from surfing i can get it from doing design or yeah. a blog or my photography yeah um uh, photography is very therapeutic 
seems to me like half the time you're doing photography, you're not taking pictures, but you're you're chasing a moon or or a, a lighting <laughs> or positioning yourself precariously on rocks. I mean, so that to me screams flow state where you're you're um, paying attention to details and trying to be there. And, and they're ultimately for the moment where it all comes together Yes, and you're ready to capture it and you, you know, have the, oh, your God. bracketing set and all those it things. Feels that go so into it feels so good. Yeah. When you, when you just, when you nail it and you look at the preview and you just go, yes. Okay. And you're like, and you're so pumped. And yeah. in, in the morning, it's great because it, it energizes me. Right. It also, also, it's so satisfying. It is also de-energizing at the same time. Okay. Right, so I get up at four a.m. Yeah. or three. Well, actually, I'll get up like three thirty a.m. Yeah. And then go surf for a couple hours in the dark, and I see the sky is starting to change. I'm like, well, those clouds are gonna be good. So I wrap up my surfing. I quickly go, and then I go shoot for the next right. hour, hour and a half. By the time I get home, I've already been up for f- five hours. Right. I've surfed awesome waves. I've taken all these pictures. I've been one with nature. Yeah. I've taken it all in. The rest of the day, honestly, it's kind of a, it just doesn't live up to it. It yeah. doesn't. Um, but at night, <laughs> if I do a really good photo shoot at night, like I get the great sunset mm. and then it goes to blue hour and mm. then it really goes off because mm. all sorts of interesting things happen at blue hour. And then the Milky Way comes out. Next thing I know, I come home at nine, 10 o'clock at night and I am wound up. Mm. I am so high mm-hmm. on life. It's crazy. I can't hardly sleep. Mm. I'm just buzzing. And I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to. And that's the worst thing. Every yeah. photographer does it. Yeah, just, how do you get I'm up in the morning? I'm just going to preview a couple that. of them. I'm just going to preview a couple right. of them. And then pretty soon, an hour and a half, you've edited for an hour and a half. And now yeah. it's midnight. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, it's highly energizing, but the rest of the day can seem pointless. Mm. Uh, it sounds really sad, but it can kind of feel like, Oh, okay. Now I got to go work and I got to do all this other stuff Mm -hmm. because really on a really good day where the surf is great and the shooting is great, the conversation screens, I go home 830, you know, been up for four hours, five hours, 830 in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. 830 in the morning. (laughs) I feel like I'm done. Yeah. Right. Cause I've, I've experienced enough joy and satisfaction for the entire day, yeah. really, as far as far as like if there was, if I didn't have to earn a living, that literally would be the end That'd of my enough. day. I would probably, I would always do something interesting, but it would be on my terms all the time and everything yeah. like that. But yeah, it's it's so satisfying and it's so amazing. And then you go back to the real world, and I'm sitting at my computer and I'm answering the phone. I'm like, did I just really, did that just really happen? Yeah. Was I surfing under the stars? Did we see a meteor explode yeah. in the sky uh-huh. that lit up the horizon? And did I really do all that shooting? And was I running around the rocks? Because, you know, a couple hours later, I'm at my computer yeah. inside looking at a screen. It's How do you weird. stay motivated? I mean, cause I get the feeling when you've done some, when you've already done something fantastic in the day it's it's energizing but it also kind of creates this <laughs> laissez-faire it does. uh feeling about the rest of the day how do you stay focused because I, I can only imagine that you know the same mind that works hard to perfect the the pertinent details of the projects you've done is probably an awesome mind to have for the work you do how do you stay focused and and bring that level of quality to you know your paying gigs i just do yeah that fo- focus and, and motivation has never been a problem. And I don't know how to, people ask me, well, how do you do it, right? How do you, because you ask like, how do you have no fear mm-hmm. of failing or being embarrassed or being compared to others? I don't know because it's not something that I achieved. I was just born that way, right? This is my natural yeah. state. And focus, commitment, and follow through is my natural state. It seems like everything I get involved in, I do for at least 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know, I lifted weights for like 15 mm-hmm. years. When I got into mountain biking, it was a 10 year stretch. When mm-hmm. I did yoga, it was 10 years of yoga. When I became a vegetarian, I was 20, it was 30 years mm-hmm. being a vegetarian. So I just, 
you know, I've been homeowners association for 15 now, wow. president of the homeowners association, Alamer Park for 15 years. Wow. So I don't have a problem with commitment. Mm. <laughs> and and uh, and I'm I'm the opposite of a commitment foe. I like committing myself and giving myself to something because it gives me purpose. Yeah. Right. So I find purpose in committing to things for a long period of time. Some of it could be for me. Some of mm-hmm. it's completely selfless. Mm-hmm. Some of it's a blend of both. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes doing something for yourself is also overlaps with making things better for other people, sure. right? They kind of go together a lot you of times. You could argue that, you know, being selfish in a way actually makes things better for other people too, because if everybody's taking care of themselves in a, in a responsible way, by extension, you're, you're giving other people permission to do the same. And sometimes that's a hard thing to do is just to take care of yourself. Yeah, I mean, there's a yeah, the jail is full of people that didn't take care of yeah, themselves. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. So I don't have it. You know, how do you do it? It's like I don't. I honestly don't know because this is just how I am. Yeah. And I don't know any other way to live. So I always have too many commitments. I'm always overextended okay. a little bit. Yeah. But the thing is, as soon as I am not overextended. I always find something else to add to it. It never, I don't go, oh, great. Now I can kind of coast for a little bit because those two projects are done. Nope. I'm going to find two more projects to fill it in. So I'm right at the edge of my comfort level. So I'm right, just barely able to hold on. Mm. Obviously I crave it Mm -hmm. and I like it and I get some kind of reward out of it. I don't know what it is, Mm. but I have a lifelong history of doing this over and over and yeah. over taking risks taking on too much not worrying about knowing everything in the beginning just think i'll just figure it out it'll be yeah. fine and and committing to things long term without any thought like maybe i shouldn't do this mm-hmm. right maybe this is too much maybe i don't need another project if it sounds exciting i just take it and then i i uh, i'll figure it out right just say yes and then figure it out. That's the uh, that's the way of the improviser. It strikes me as you've in- improvised your life into a, a very happy state. You know, the <laughs> improviser says yes and <laughs> yes. You know, the whole theory. What yes else? and yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you also said uh, in your sidewalk bubble gum, uh, you said something to the effect that you um, you always take action because in action there's control and you like control. Yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah. But I also, it's, it's funny. I'm very comfortable with chaos and improvising. Yeah. That's the part that's interesting. But I also like stability and predictability. This is the way I've described it. And that is you need to have some kind of base. Well, improv is based upon this. When you go watch a good improv troupe, it appears they're making it all up. Mm. But they've been workshopping for hours, mm-hmm. and they have a base of level of skill mm-hmm. to draw upon. They're not just starting from scratch. Right. They know, like, oh, we've done the airplane routine. We've done this routine. And, and they've workshopped these things over and over and over again, and they have a certain rhythm. Right. From the outside, it's like, oh, my God, they're geniuses. They just made that up. The audience gave them suggestions. They made it up. We don't realize they've kind of done something similar – and use these same skills and, and licks. Yeah. Right? They're like guitar licks. Yeah. And you can bring them out, and you know it'll get a laugh, and you know it'll keep the flow going. And if it stops flowing, they know how to bring it back because mm. they've, they've done it, right? So improv can only work if there is some kind of foundation. Right. So I'm always taking care of my foundation. I always have to have some little foundation. I like to know where I'm sleeping every mm, night. Good move. I like to know what I'm going to eat. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I, I want. I like to eat the same thing every day. Yeah. I like to go to bed at the same time. I like. I have this my little routine yeah. that I don't like disrupted. Yeah. And then then everything after that can be full blown chaos, and I'm totally fine. But if you took away my place to sleep and took away my food. That would be the absolute first thing mm-hmm. I would get under control yeah, yeah. because that allows me to do 
So that's the, the trade-off. I, the, the stability I crave is really just to give me a base on which to play mm -hmm. and improvise. Yeah, it, it, that's funny because we talked about, we were talking about pottery and sculpture yeah. where, you know, I said, I'm a potter, not a sculptor. You give me a lump of clay, I have no idea what to do with it unless you put it on a wheel and spin it and say, make a vessel. Right. And then I know what parameters I have to deal with and I can find creativity and flow and I can learn from mistakes from there and kind of iterate into some level of skill. But I don't know how to do that with a blank piece of paper or a lump of clay. Um, not you, Clay, but yeah, yeah, silly joke. Um, well, that's because it's not your skill set. Yeah, I, but it. I, I guess what I'm getting at, what, what I'm looking for here, is because I, I, I want more of the. I want more Clay Butler in everybody's life. That this willingness to make a bit of a mess and to get some momentum on something they want to do, um, something they want to express. It just seems like we through the media we take in, it seems like everyone's got their shit together. You know, we get a, a, a polished image of almost oh, everything. Yeah. I mean, we, it's I know true that there's some rough YouTube stuff where it's just the content only that yes. you're getting, but we're getting a polished version of life now. And we won't be happy waiting for that to happen to us. And it seems to me like you've meticulously not taken in kind of garbage. You've, focused yourself on being in the moment, producing good work, saying what you want to say and giving it away, teaching others and interacting with others. And I just, I think that's, you know, when I was looking through your body of work, I had, I wished that I had met you earlier in my life because I'm, I just wanted to be around that more, you know, and you've taught me, you know, we've talked We've talked, and we kind of glossed over this, but you casually said, I surf at 3.30 in the morning. Um, and it, you know, it's quite obvious there's no light at 3.30 in the morning. So you've oh, learned a completely different skill set there, and we should talk about that too. But um, back to my point was, how can, do you think you can teach people to have a little bit, to take themselves a little less seriously and be willing to put themselves out there and then find that momentum to keep moving with it? Yes. Okay. Good. That's, that's a good answer. I think I have one piece of advice. Yeah. Our brains are too sophisticated for our, our own good, really. They're a burden in a lot of ways. We can do amazing things with our minds, but our minds are self-sabotaging ourselves all the time. It gets in the way. So the one of the biggest obstacles in life is what if. Hmm. When everyone, somebody says, what if? I'm like, I'm not interested. What can we do? Mm -hmm. What can we do? Mm. Right right now, what are our options? Okay, pick the best one, let's do it. But what if? I don't care about what if. What's our best option right now? Yeah. And let's do that. What ifs are really, really powerful because they're never, they're never completed, right? You'll see people all the time. Oh, I don't know. Uh, what if... I don't know. I'm worried. What if it doesn't work? And then they, that, that's the end. Right. The best thing you could do for yourself is workshop the what if. All right. Hmm. If what something stop, okay. Just like, oh, uh, you know, I've always wanted to do pottery. Oh, what if I'm not very good at it? Okay. What will happen if you're not very good at it? Well, I, won't be very good at it. How long do you think it will take you to figure that out? I don't know. I guess if I gave it like three or four months and I still can't do it, it's like, okay, what would be the f cost? Well, the classes are $15 and they're once a week. I said, okay, so you're $95 for $95 in one hour a week mm -hmm. or two hours a week. You can find out if you can throw pottery. Yeah. That's the what if. Is that, a, is that a risk of any sort? And it's like, well, no, it's not a risk of any sort, really. I can afford 95, and I have an hour a week, and I have $95. I said, then do it. Mm -hmm. That's the trouble. People do not answer their own what-if yeah. questions. They just go, oh, my God, but what if? I don't know. And I was like, well, take it to its logical conclusion. Mm. And for me, I have a really simple one. Does this have a high probability... And ending in break bankruptcy 
permanent injury or death. There you go. That's real fear. That's, That's real fear. fear. That's yeah. a real what if. Yeah. What if I jumped off this cliff? Let's see. It's, it's 100 feet. If I lived, I'd probably be crippled for life. I won't jump off the cliff. There you go. Solid, right? solid logic. Real simple. <laughs> um, that's kind of like if I'm not going to, if it's not going to bankrupt me, injure me, or cause death. Yeah. With a reasonable probability. Right. I'm not talking about abstracts like, well, you could die on a plane. Yeah, right. It's like, I'm not talking about that. I'm yeah. talking about engaging this to the best of your abilities. Is there a decent probability of these horrible three outcomes? Right. If not, do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, oh, if I get embarrassed. Okay. What if, don't say that's like, oh, what if I get embarrassed? Or what if I fail? Or what if I stumble? Or what if I, okay, let's, once again, let's walk through that. You give a speech, you stumble a little bit, and, well, I get embarrassed, okay, and, well, I, I feel embarrassed, and, let's keep going, right. what happens the next day? Well, I go to work the next day, and, uh, okay, did you lose any of your friends? Did you lose your house? Did you go bankrupt? Are you in jail now? Did somebody throw you in bad speech jail? No. Yeah. <laughs> then do it. Yeah. I, it's, people don't answer their yeah. own what ifs yeah. and it's that what if that holds everybody back that's yeah. why i've come down to the conclusion it's the one if i don't live in the what if at all yeah it well if i do have a what if it's the opposite hmm. what if this works okay right what if this is fun what if i love this what if i pull it off so if i do entertain a what if it's always in the positive right the negatives i don't so if someone, if everyone would just like, whenever those negative thoughts come in, take them to their logical conclusion in mm -hmm. your mind. You can mm -hmm. talk out loud. I talk mm -hmm. out loud in the car all the time. I have deep conversations with myself and I argue with nobody. That's good. I practice. <laughs> I practice my game in my car yeah. by myself. I just talk out. I, when I'm surfing by myself, I'll have full on conversations about politics or yeah. whatever. I'm just like workshopping ideas in my head. So I'm kind of prepared and focused. So I can pull something out later on. It's like, well, I have, I have an answer for that, actually. I was thinking about that. Yeah. Um, so don't let the what if workshop it because almost, one, almost every what if loses its power if you actually follow yeah. the trail. It's kind of like secrets. Secrets have power because they're secret. When they're out, they have no power anymore. Mm. I just let it out. That's why yeah. people love to confide. Right. That's right. They've been holding on to this thing and they just tell one person, they're like, oh, just saying it out loud robs it of its power. So say these things out loud. If mm -hmm. you're scared, say, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. And just listen to yourself say that. I'm scared. And then you ask yourself, why am I scared? And have a conversation with mm -hmm. yourself and, and have it out loud. Mm. There's a power of saying things out loud. Mm-hmm. Um, just naming it, just That's naming kind of what you do in meditation, right? Is you just go, there's this thought and you notice it and then it can go away. But if you resist it, it just sort of, as they say, what we resist persists. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. Um, I have a, so I'm going to go a little bit sideways here, but it, it's, right. it's on my mind. I have this fear that we've replaced the, the dopamine rush of progress and um, seeing the momentum of, of an iteration of, of a project or getting better at a sport or getting a little better at public speaking or those, those things that those, where we go from some discomfort to finding a little bit of a facility. I'm fearful that we've replaced that dopamine rush with the dopamine rush we get from our phones and the internet and that kind of thing. Oh, there's no doubt. Okay. Yeah. That's you, pretty obvious. You see that too, because you don't strike me as the type myself. of person. Okay. So you're normal. <laughs> I mean, normal for now, which doesn't seem all that normal. We're having these whole lives on our screens. And I wonder if we're stunting our growth personally. You know, I think that's on everyone's mind. It's even on kids' minds. Yeah. There's already a backlash to technology among kids. Hmm. There's, you, we have this idea that everything just gets worse exponentially forever. Right? Like, wow, the, the population, we have a billion more people than we had 10 years ago. Well, eventually we're going to have a trillion. 
It's like, no, there's a carrying capacity yeah. and somehow it's going to stop. There's we real either, limits. We either could become spontaneously fertile, mm-hmm. I mean infertile, right? which is already happening among men globally. Hmm. Sperm counts are way, way down. Well, and in Japan, people are just not even having they, kids. They're not even having kids. They're not even well, having relationships. They're not even having relationships. Yeah. yeah. So that could be just uh, maybe that's what the future holds. If yeah. we reach a certain population, we just instinctively stop our body body shot shut down the procreation right. process to bring that population back down but you know kids are they're already like putting timers on their phones mm. and they're craving like listening to vinyl mm-hmm. or or cooking food mm-hmm. from scratch yeah um because authentic experiences never go out of style and we need them and every generation has to figure out how they're going to do that, right? And the kids are figuring that out right now. Now, some of them will never, ever get it together, and they're just going to be completely addicted to their phone, and right. just like some people get addicted to alcohol sure. and drugs and or sex or whatever, or addicted to food, right? That always going to happen. But I just don't think... The past tells me that there's a limit on how much kids can be on their phone before they themselves reject Mm -hmm. their own behavior and go, wow, this is, doesn't feel right. Right. And they'll work out a happy medium. They'll do things. They, they might have a rule among their friends. Okay. We're doing friend time. Now everyone put away your phones. Mm -hmm. And if you take out your phone, you can't, you have to leave, Mm. right? You literally have to leave, (laughs) right? They'll, they'll, they'll figure out a way to police their own behavior, but it is very seductive. Yeah. It's by design. Yeah, absolutely. We have the most brilliant minds. The, here's, here's something, I don't know if we have time to get into this, but I get, really a, I get really frustrated that we as individuals are supposed to be so strong, so resilient, that if something, if we fall prey to junk food, or our technology, or whatever it is, it's 100% our fault. Right. When on the other end, these processed food companies literally hire the top psychologists, biologists, anthropologists, everyone, the, and they do very sophisticated analysis yeah. where they'll take a bunch of people behind a closed door and they go, try this chip. They close the door. They, they, they rate it yeah. and they go and they got to find out where, which Dorito you cannot stop eating. Yeah. Once they find out, they find out when you can't stop eating because it triggers that perfect sweet spot between mm-hmm. savory, sweet, and salty. And crunchy. Crunchy, right? Yeah. Triggers off enough sugar, enough fat. Yeah. It's triggering all of our ancestral yeah. biological wiring and turning it against us. Yeah. Then they unleash these chips. They advertise them on children's television. They shove them in your store. The shelves are filled with them. And then they blame you for eating too many Doritos. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you can't. That Mm -hmm. is not fair. Right. Right? They need to take some responsibility. And we haven't done that. Yeah, we haven't. We always blame the individual, but we never hold the system accountable for creating a situation that's, that's designed to have a high Mm -hmm. probability of Mm -hmm. failure. It's intentionally, you. these games are all designed to make it difficult to stop. Mm-hmm. Instagram, the algorithms on Instagram and Facebook and yeah. YouTube are very sophisticated and they are learning you faster than you know yourself. Yeah. And they're looking for clicks. What gets clicks? Um, uh, clickbait headlines. Mm-hmm. Extremes. Yeah. We click on the extremes. Oh my God, a fail video. Mm-hmm. Oh, gotta yeah. go to the fail video, yeah. right? Oh my God, a, a building blows up, right? So, and then it, and then the more you click on those those extreme experiences, the more it feeds you extreme yeah. experiences, and you can polarize. Now, if you're more conservative oriented, you're gonna go this way. If you're more liberal, you're gonna go yeah. a different way. If you're into motorcycles, you're gonna go way into motorcycles, and we become siloed. Yeah, with fewer shared experiences, but it's not fair. It's not fair to blame the individual for failing in a system that was literally designed to make them fail. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's It's still your responsibility. It's ultimately your responsibility to to resist and and thing. But at the same time, I'm also very sympathetic to the person struggling because. 
yes, it's true. They are working against your own yeah. interests. The whole system's working against your own interests because your interests are not profitable. Yeah. It om- so, th- and, and I think that kind of wraps up what I've been thinking this whole time after, you know, looking through your work and just kind of watching you move through the world, um, at least, you know, how I've known you is you, um, you've, you've become addicted in, in the best possible sense to <laughs> these beautiful details in life, you know, like the sunsets and the sun. I mean, all you have to do is read, you know, um, Twilight Ninja on Facebook to see how happy people are to see these images um, interesting, you know, huh? Oh, it's amazing. They see they because see. they look like what they've seen. You, you don't over process anything. You you process them to. It's like that looks like what I saw, and then and yes. people come together and share these experiences with dawn and and a lot, a lot more dusk. I think you'll find a lot more people up <laughs> at sunset than sunrise. But and I have a really yes, I've noticed that on I have my passionate followers. Yeah. Quite often they'll say they see God in my yeah. they in my work they see God's work in my images yeah. right they, wow. they and uh, and it makes their day and they're inspired and then I've got this crazy share to engagement ratio so hmm. I might have I put up a gallery and the next day it might have forty six likes but thirty shares oh wow people are saying you should see this to their friends yes that's cool they're not so much in they're not really focusing on clicking like 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 they're distributing it yeah. this this makes them feel something and yeah. they want to share it. and these are yeah. galleries that have like 16 images yeah and if 30 people sharing that whole gallery is very and most of them aren't engaging right hmm. so they're obviously getting something from yeah. it and then putting that on their on their facebook and i just find it really interesting and once again i still do it for myself Mm. i would continue if i got no likes no engagement no shares i would still go take photos and i would put them on facebook and i'd put them on because i'm doing it for me now if everyone else likes it that's a huge bonus that's fun that was like wow this is great but i really it's really strange but i don't care if you like me i don't care if you approve of what I'm doing at all. Yeah. I no, I don't care. You can hate me. I don't care if you hate me. I just, I've never, it doesn't, it's okay. It's okay not to like me. I'm not for everybody, right? Yeah. Nobody's for everybody. Right. And you have to be fine with that. It's like, ah, oh, Clay, he's just, I've always rubbed people the wrong way. A certain amount of people have sure. always, right? Sure. We all have them. Yeah, yeah. Um, most of the time, you hope they just stay silent and you don't have to hear about it. But sometimes they'll come up and tell you or they somehow attack you. Now you can attack you on social media, right? Right, right. But um, that's fine. That's their thing, right? Whatever it is, I represent triggers. I don't know what's going on in their life. Well, But for whatever I'm doing, I'm pissing them off. I'm not proud that I'm pissing them off. Sure. But I'm not sad or ashamed either. It's just like, okay, that didn't really – I'm not for you, right? I'm not for you. And that's okay. But I think, well, the thing I like about the photography is that you could you could argue that okay, your um, straight dope dad isn't for everybody because not everybody's wow. no, a dad, not at all, yeah, but, you know. And um, but I think it was great for dads because they could go there and and see that oh, my experience is actually I shared know. by because almost all the blogs are written by women, yeah, as far as about parenting, ones. parenting, yeah. And then with um, Sidewalk Bubblegum, it was political, yes. and um, and it you know it wasn't overtly attacking any uh, particular party or person. It was more idea or concepts and ideas. Yes. But contrary to those, photography and the beauty of nature brings everybody together. And it's true. I don't think you can hate a sunset. You, how picture. can you hate a sunset? <laughs> yeah, you can't you gotta, possibly. You or a problem. rainbow. Yeah. You know, um, and if you can get them all together at once, if you could get a Milky Way. If you could get a full moon, the Milky Way, a rainbow, and a sunset and a sunrise, some flowers also help. Some people flowers love flowers. Well, yeah. I just noticed trends. Yeah. Rainbows, people love, love rainbows. rainbows. They love sunsets, sunrises, Milky Ways, and any phase of the moon. It's inspiring. I think there's a reason for that. Yeah. Because now we don't think about why. You see it all the time. 
in the morning, people pull over on a good yeah. sunrise or sunset around town. They'll stop. Yeah. Traffic just stops along East Cliff and West Cliff yeah. everywhere. Just people just pull over yeah. and they just watch it and they take it in. Why? Sure, it's beautiful, but a lot of things are beautiful. Mm. I think it goes way back to millions of years of evolution where the sun rising and the sun setting really meant something, yeah. right? Sun's rising, day's starting, time to go do this. You pay attention. You have to pay attention to the seasons to know when to migrate. Mm. When's the herds going to move to go chase the buffalo or chase the woolly mammoth or what berries are in season? And you start noticing these things. Oh, when the moon's in this phase, this happens. When the stars are in this. So at one point, this was absolutely crucial for our survival to be able to pay attention to subtleties yeah. in the clouds. How are they moving? Is rain coming? Is it not coming? Is it time to plant? Is it time to hunt? Is it right? That doesn't go away. And I think that's the real reason people are still in awe of sunsets and sunrises and, and spectacular nature because it's always been spectacular to us and crucial to our survival. Yeah. You had to notice when the sun gets up. You had to notice these things. And what kind of day it was going to be. Season, oh, yeah. yeah. This, the, the, the leaves are starting yeah. to turn. Uh-oh. It's time to move. Take, you know, pack up the tribe and go move south or yeah. where the snow is going to come, right? So yeah. it's really important. So we're hyper-focused on that even now. And you can see it yeah. in the evening around here when people just, from their commute, they just want to get home, but they will stop dead in their tracks and pull over and just watch a beautiful why, right? It's so primal. Mm. It's, it's part of us. We have to have it. That's why Central Park was built. Yeah. Have you ever been to Central Park in New York? Yeah. It's yeah. miles of just ponds and trees and playgrounds. I think New York would be unbearable without it. Yeah. I think it's what keeps that whole city sane. We need a, a true meaning. And like what you're saying about the sunset and sunrise the the meaning goes back it's like the evolutionary biology yeah. what does the day hold what needs to happen for the season and then you know this kind of wraps back into flow as being something that we need to do as humans um when details are important and decisions are made um there's there's a, there's some ancient meaning in that that is deeply satisfying and I think that's what's, you know, well, I guess here's the question. Where, where can people come to, um, if they want your, you to work, I mean, you, you oh, yeah. have, so you have a business, yes. um, which takes this unique and brilliant clay Butler mind and puts it, uh, to work for your clients. And that is yes. my main focus these days is package design. Yeah. And that. Basically, everything you see on the shelf has a package. Yeah. It's a jar, a box, stand-up pouch. Somebody had to design that. I designed that. Mm. I also provide the entire branding experience. Sometimes I name the product and write the body copy, and sometimes I file their trademarks because they don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, E-commerce sites, trade show booth, vehicle wraps, everything you need to launch a company, but specifically a product. Yeah. That's what I do for people all the time. So I've learned the ins entire supply chain. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I bring to the table. There's a lot of people that do good package design. Sure. Right? There's lots of talent out there. And you can shop on price all over. You can get somebody in India or something. Do a good job. Good job. Uh, yeah, there's plenty. Um, but you're not going to run into too many designers. Because I've worked with so many startups, mm -hmm. I've gone through all of the pain and trial and tribulations that my client has. I've lived it as well. Yeah. And each one provides a lesson. So when you come to me, I'm just not designing a pretty package. I'm thinking about, okay, we got to get the printer and the co-packer on the same page because we can't have the roll stock delivered in the wrong orientation for their equipment. Mm. Right. You have to think about substrates and films and what will work mm -hmm. and, so uh, FDA compliance, uh, when will the bottles arrive? All that stuff. Where are you cool. going to store it? So yeah, I know, I know the whole supply chain, but my focus is 
making packaging, giving you a fighting chance in the marketplace, yeah. right? Because they have to pick it up first. Right. If it just sits there, and no one will know how good it is. And it's that same brain we're talking about that's um, that has its cravings based on our our ancestry and our our evolution. It 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 craves things, and creating a a product that people want. Um, based on its packaging, seems it seems like you have a brain uh, that's well suited for that. Um, it's exciting. It's fun. Yeah. That's probably why I've done it so long. Yeah, it's difficult. It's yeah. never easy. So I don't see any end in sight to the like. I've done other things. I'm like, ah, oh, it's not as exciting anymore. Mm. Yeah, I've built a lot of websites. It's more rote now. Right. It's right. You know how it's going to come out. You do one hot sauce. The next hot sauce brand is completely different than the other one. <laughs> That's cool. Right? The different brand story, different look, maybe yeah. a different bottle. Everything about it's different. Yeah. So it's the same, but not. Yeah. As far as the intellectual um, uh, uh, work you have to put into it, it's it might as well not be hot sauce. It could be anything. Yogurt, mm. chips. So... It keeps me on my toes and I like it. Mm. I like the fact that it's in three dimensions and it's always difficult and it's always a challenge and it never gets boring. Cool. So I think that's why I'm still doing it. Um, I will definitely put well all your ventures into yes. the show notes and, and link to it. But what do you do you have any idea what the next um thing that you'll be learning and, and <laughs> iterating and perfecting? I mean you kind of went back to photography with Twilight Ninja and that's been hugely successful and it looks like very rewarding. Do you have any idea what the next thing you're going to learn is? Well, nutritionally, I've always been this interested in nutrition yeah. and stuff, but um, I'm really deep into it right now. That's really fascinating because it started with my own journey, right? right. Everything starts with your own interests. Sure. So, you know, I was a vegetarian for 30 years yeah. and then, um, I drifted into, uh, I started cleaning up my diet, got rid of all the cheap carbs, yeah. you know, Oh, this is working. Lost a lot of bunch of weight. And, and then, uh, then I just, then I drifted to low carb, mm -hmm. high fat. Sure. And then I started doing keto before I even knew what it was. Right. Then I added meat to my diet mm -hmm. and it just changed everything mm. overnight. I'm like, wow, muscles start growing. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I be, I'm becoming resilient like I was in my 20s. That's great. And uh, I'm like, oh, wonder why. So you start learning those things. And my LDL cholesterol shot through the roof, which happens to a lot of people who are fit but go keto. Mm -hmm. Generally drives your LDL really high. So you start learning why. Is it harmful? Is it bad? And is there really a relationship with LDL and cholesterol? And you start finding out, it's like, God, oh, there really isn't a lot of evidence. Mm. It's a lot of speculation and... Studying no. on poor populations. Or more and, nefarious than that. It was yeah. the demonization uh, of fat. And, demonization. Yeah. It gets really complicated. Yeah. So you go down the nutritional rabbit hole and you start finding out that almost everything that you thought you knew about nutrition yeah. actually doesn't have anything behind it. Yeah. From fiber to eight glasses of water today to should we eat meat or not, are vegetables healthy or not. There's almost nothing behind any of it. Mm. And when you find that out, it blows your mind. So then you have to rebuild a knowledge base from scratch, reading the what little actual science there is, controlled mm -hmm. feeding studies mm. with, you know, double blind and mm -hmm. seeing how bio and, and looking at ancestral diets. You have to rebuild it because unfortunately our whole concept in nutrition is not based on anything yeah. it really isn't well it's based on so that's my Com latest Com project but actually you, you know what actually i'm going to learn is more is i have a, i should bring this i have a company that both makes a snack okay. called berg bites named after daniel berg okay co-founder it's amazing it's delicious an oat energy bite okay and then drinks drnx right just like it says that's a a sugar-free adaptogenic performance water and it's delicious, might I add. It is really delicious. <laughs> My softball team agrees. <laughs> That's going to be a very long learning process yeah. because now I'm learning about how distribution works, slotting fees, returns. Um, yeah, 
learning it. Yeah. Once again, I'm involved in something you're, I've never done before. You're, well, it seems to be your wheelhouse, you know, <laughs> no. where, where you find comfort and, um, you know, freedom, which is a, a, an amazing skill. I, I wish we had more to, I mean, there's more yeah. to talk obviously, um, about with you. Um, I'll link to all that stuff though. All your projects. I, I can't believe how many they are and they're all such high quality. Um, Thank you. And I, and the television just, stuff's not even up. I still have like, <laughs> I have a, a couple hundred hours of, of my award-winning television shows. Fantastic. And, uh, but yeah, trying to convert SVHS into, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, you've got, you've got a few things going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming today. Um, thanks for joining Untold Santa Cruz. You, Clay Butler's got a story that uh, I felt like it needed to be told. So right, appreciate thanks. you being here, Clay. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Two days after I recorded this episode, I paddled out towards the glow sticks in the dark Pacific Ocean, knowing Clay had probably been out there for a couple hours already. As I paddled up to him, he said, Oh, dude, I just realized I totally forgot to tell you about the most important story of my life. When I was in elementary school, we loved to play soccer at recess. We'd set up goals with sweatshirts and play as much as we could. I liked to defend the goal and help out the goalie. One day, a shot came whizzing by and went right over one of the sweatshirts. The other team said, goal. My team said, no goal. They argued for a while, taking up valuable recess time. And then they turned and looked at me and said, what was it, Clay? I thought about it for a second and I said, it was a goal. My team said, no, Clay. And their team said, yay. A few minutes later, nearly the same shot came by. Same result, their team said, goal. My team said, no. And they turned and looked at me again. And they said, what was it, Clay? And I said, it was no goal. And everyone went right back to playing. And that's when I knew who I was. That's the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. What I realized after recording was I wanted to talk to Clay about everything he was up to, and there simply wasn't enough time. His skills are so broad, his passion so deep, and his interests so eclectic that we just couldn't get to it all, not even close. You probably heard the odd transition at the end where I realized we're running out of time, and I still wanted to give him the chance to let you know about his professional work. Well, everything we talked about is in the show notes. If you're interested in any of it, please reach out to him. I know you'll enjoy working with him as much as I do.